Okay, welcome to uh, Psych 200 um, Intro to Research Methods. Today we're talking about basically statistics, descriptive and inferential statistics. Uh, for your book, this is chapter 12 and 13. Remember, your book is electronic, it's online. I don't really follow it that much. So I, you know, <clears throat> but I'm trying to keep with the, uh, I, I guess, uh, at least tell you guys what, what chapters they would be in, uh, on your textbook, what chapters we were actually on. Um, this is gonna be um, you know, one week of lecturing, so two actual lectures, two videos, okay? But today we're just talking about the descriptive part, part descriptive uh, statistics. So uh, the inferential stuff we'll talk about on Wednesday. <clears throat> okay, um, so we need to know about statistics, okay? In order for you guys to you know, do your project, you don't just design a survey, you don't just collect data, but you need to know how to compute some stuff. And the stuff I'm gonna show you is not that hard, okay? Especially the descriptive stuff. So first of all, what are descriptive statistics? So descriptive statistics, we're talking about methods that help you organize information, summarize it, okay? Simplify the results obtained from research studies. So you're just organizing your information, right? Summarizing it, reporting it. Um, there's not much uh, more than, than that, okay? <clears throat> uh, examples would be the frequency, right? Uh, we're looking at frequencies. I'll look at that, even though you're probably not gonna be reporting that. Uh, we'll look at percentages, means, medians, standard deviations, uh, correlations. All those are descriptive. By the way, I have um, certain things in, uh, in bold there. Okay, so frequency, percentage, mean, median, standard deviation. Uh, I consider that to be a bit more descriptive. Now, correlations are a bit uh, are uh, descriptive as well. <clears throat> but if you're going to be doing correlations, I consider that a little bit more advanced. It's not difficult, but you know, that's something you can do if you're doing an honors project, correlations, and then go on to the inferential stuff. But for the rest of you, percentages, means, standard deviations, that's pretty much what you need. <clears throat> and uh, I'll explain as, uh, as we move along, okay? Uh, when I show you guys the examples. When I show you, uh, so I'm gonna, we're gonna talk about this first, and then I'm gonna show you guys how to compute this, uh, probably in Excel, but it's similar in Google Forms. Uh, there are videos, by the way, I, that I've already posted that I created uh, last semester uh, on there in the tutorial section on how to do this stuff, how to calculate this stuff, so you can, you can look at those. Um, so I'm not going to record them again. I'm going to show you how to do this once I stop this recording, but I'm not going to record that part because it, it's already there. It's already online, okay? Uh, we need to know a little bit of terminology first. What is a statistic, first of all? A statistic, it says there, is a summary value that describes a sample. So a statistic is basically usually some number that describes something about the sample, okay? Remember when you uh, do a study, whether it's a survey, an experiment, whatever it is, uh, you can't actually study everybody. So you actually, you know, use a collection of people called a sample, okay? And when you refer to things that have to do with the sample, or like, for instance, a number, uh, that would be called a statistic. For instance, the average IQ for, for a sample of 100 people is 103. Let's say that's what your, uh, your study found, right? That the IQ is 103. Maybe it's a little bit higher because these are you know, people in college or something like that. Let's say community college, right? Uh, for the uh, you know, other colleges, the four-year colleges and you know, others, um, it might be even higher depending on how prestigious the college is. But that's the statistic, okay? It's a number or something. It doesn't have to be a number necessarily. Could be something else. Um, but usually a number uh, that describes something about the sample, okay? And here's something you guys probably haven't heard of. Uh, a parameter. A parameter uh, is a summary value that describes a population. So when we're talking about a population, that is everybody out there, the numbers that describe the population are called parameters, okay? So for instance, uh, you know, the average score for a population, right? Like the average IQ is, uh, let's say for the population is 100. Let's just say that's the average IQ, right? That's a parameter. You guys are not gonna describe parameters, okay? You're gonna describe statistics, okay? That's what you have to use. Um, you're gonna be dealing with samples, not really populations. So let's talk about these descriptive statistics. Um, First uh, kind we're gonna talk about it just has to do with frequencies. Remember, descriptive statistics, so they just describe. They describe what's happening. What's the average for this? Uh, what's the percentage of this or that? <clears throat> Another thing you could do is basically, what's the frequency? How many do we have of each? So frequency distributions, right? 
these are some of the first things you learn about when you take a statistics class, okay? Frequency distributions uh, basically are, uh, they're basically, uh, you know, it could be a, a graph or a table or something like that, uh, that displays basically what you have and how many there are of each, to put it simply. So it displays two types of information. So the set of categories, we can call that X, right? You know, set of categories. I mean, what do you have? You know, it could be, uh, you know, sex, for instance, and let's say IQ to keep uh, with our example, right? So the set of categories would be like sex and the other one would be AQ, and uh, I, IQ, for instance. And then the number of individuals in each category. How many are there of each? How many males, females? Uh, <clears throat> and then uh, what are the scores for, let's say, IQ? That would be F, okay? The number of individuals in each category. I'll show you guys another example in a moment that will make it really clear. It's very simple. And you guys aren't really gonna do this. This is not really what you report you know, for psychology. Um, we'll talk about what you do report in a moment. Uh, if you uh, use what's called the frequency distribution table, that shows how many scores there are of each type in table form, okay? I'll show you images so it's clear. If you use a frequency distribution graph, that shows you how many scores there are in graph form. And here's an example. Here's a frequency distribution table, okay? Remember X is basically, uh, I mean, well, the categories basically, okay? And then F is how many there are of each type, okay? Um, so this table shows the distribution of scores from a five point quiz. X is basically the, you know, how many, you know, the, um, how many there are, not how many there are, but the type that you have. So on a quiz, for instance, you can have, uh, on a five point quiz, you could have people who scored a perfect score, score five, you can have people who score four, three, two, one, right, zero, if they get none, right? So those are the, that's how many, that's basically the, how many types there are, okay? you can have six different types of scores there. And F is how many there are of each, okay? F is the frequency. So there's one person that scored a five, okay? Three people scored four, four people scored three, three scored two, two scored one, and two people scored a zero. They didn't get any questions right. That's a frequency distribution table, okay? So as you can see over here, right? The set of categories, right? And in, the, in this case, it would be, for instance, uh, over here, like, you know, like the score, that would be the set of categories, you know, like, can they, did they score a five, a four, whatever it is? And then the frequency, how many there are of each. Let me tell you guys about a simpler example, in case you're confused. Uh, if we're talking about, let's say, uh, males and females, okay, uh, X, let's say, uh, <clears throat> would be males and females. So you'd have M and then F, that's it, that would be under X, okay? And then F would be how many there are of each. Let's say you have 12 females and 10 males. And that's it. That's also a frequency distribution table. It's simple, okay? And here are some graphs for you guys. Um, the graphs just tell you how many there are of each. So you have uh, on the, um, the, the that graph there on the, um, on the left, okay? Look at the scores in the bottom. Uh, it goes zero through six. There are no sixes. The quiz doesn't go that far. So zero through five. Okay, and then you can see on the, the vertical uh, line there, it tells you the frequency, how many there are of each. So there's two people that scored zero, two that scored one, you know, and you can, you can read that graph, right? And you can see very clearly that there's more people who scored around three, okay? Uh, then there are higher numbers or lower numbers. It's a graph. It shows you, you know, visually, very, it's very clearly to see, right? Visually, uh, what the scores look like, and that's, a descriptive statistic, it just tells you what it looks like. If you do it as a graph form that, as a, as a, this is a bar graph on the left. If you do it as a line graph, a line graph would be on the right over here. And the only difference there is that rather than having bars, we have a dot, a point uh, for each, uh, basically each frequency. And then we just connected them by, you know, drawing a line through them. And that's what it looks like, okay? Uh, it's telling you the same thing as the bar graph. Okay, it's exactly the same thing. It's telling you the same thing. It's just that now we just drew a line through the midpoint of what would be each bar, okay? And that's a frequency distribution graph, okay? And this was the frequency distribution table. Both of them tell you the same thing, you know, the, the categories and then how many there are of each, okay? That's not really what you do with psychology, but, um, you know, you should know about that. 
um, what about if you have non-numerical scores or ordinal scores, okay, uh, ordinal scales? Well, you could also, um, you know, do it like this, right? This is very simple, okay? This is a uh, frequency dis distribution graph. It's a bar graph, right? It tells you how many psych majors there are, how many bio majors, how many engineering majors, education majors, business majors, and math majors, okay? So we have the frequency, again, on that vertical line on the left, and then the horizontal line is the major. In this case, though, they are categories. It's, nom it's a nominal scale. If it were to be ordinal, first, second, third, small, medium, large, it would look the same way. You would have uh, you know, the categories on the bottom. The difference with ordinal is that, of course, they're in a certain order, first, second, third, small, medium, large. This is not in any particular order, psychology, biology, English. It's not like one comes first, the other one comes second. It doesn't really matter what the order is. But uh, you can see you know, the frequency there of each one, OK? <clears throat> and that's what we mean by frequency distribution. Here's some other graphs for you guys. <clears throat> you can do it for data. It's a little bit more complicated. And by the way, I don't expect you guys to do this when you write your paper uh, based on your, uh, your research study, based on your survey results. I don't really want to see figures and graphs, right? Leave that fancy stuff out. Um, I'll tell you guys what I actually want. Um, here we have some other graphs, right? Um, <clears throat> that says there um, for the one at the top, A, uh, median income, right, in the thousands for those with a high school degree, right, those with a college degree and those with a postgraduate degree. In order to determine data like that, you have to do a little bit more, okay? Um, but you would have to calculate the average for each group separately, okay, not the average overall. But you can see there the more education you have, uh, you know, the more money you make. And this is probably a little bit outdated uh, because um, incomes should be a little bit higher now. Actually, they haven't been rising that much. That's the thing, okay? And that's what people have been complaining about is that, you know, that yeah, rich people are getting a lot richer and those of us who work, uh, yeah, we make a little bit more money every year and, um, you know, but not that much more. And incomes aren't really rising that fast relative to inflation, especially, they're kind of flat. But you can see there that it is true that if you have more education, you know, you get a job that pays a little bit more, okay? The difference, by the way, uh, is over time. If you have like a postgraduate degree, let's say like a master's or a PhD, um, you're going to make more money than if you just had a high school degree or if you just had a bachelor's degree or an AA, right? Not a whole lot at the beginning, but as the years go by, as the decades go by, you'll make a lot more money than those who have a lower degree. Over time, it makes a big difference. At the beginning, not so much. At the beginning, maybe you get an extra 20, 30 grand. That's about it per year. But over time, your salary also grows faster. Okay. Uh, and here uh, is another graph over here, the proportion preferring digital, right? A digital display where you just see, you know, like a screen, like with numbers, something like that, but there, versus that, you know, the little hands on, on, on a watch, right? Um, and you can see that the older people are, the more they prefer. Uh, you know, something that's, uh, that's digital. No, no, the older people are, the less they prefer something, the graph goes down, the less they prefer something that's digital. Just some graphs here, I'm kind of overdoing it here. I didn't really need to show you guys this one. This one's a little bit more complicated that compares groups. Um, but it's just uh, telling you about the frequency, okay? How, how often something occurs. Um, here's some descriptive statistics that are uh, a bit more useful. And more useful, especially for things that have to do with psychology, okay, which is what this is about, okay? The mean, the median, and the mode, okay? Uh, the mean is really what I want you to use. The mean is just a fancy way of saying the average, okay? The mean, okay? Often abbreviated as M or X with a bar over it. It depends on you know, whether you're looking at a statistics book or, you know, something else, okay? A publication or something like that. But the mean is the medical average of a set of scores, okay? It's just the average, okay? Um, for instance, like if you have, uh, you know, 10 scores, right? 10 people took the quiz, you add up all their scores, divide by 10, that'll give you the mean or the average. The mean can be distorted by extreme scores, okay? Sometimes scores can be really extreme, they can distort the mean, okay? Like for instance, let's say um, that uh, you take uh, in, uh, in a given uh, city in, Ca in California, like LA, uh, you look at the average income, let's say the mean income, Okay, um, the average might be really high. I don't really know what it is, but it might be really high, for instance. Um, the reason for that is that in LA or even in other places in California, 
Um, we have some people who make a lot of money. We're talking millions, tens of millions, some of them even hundreds of millions of dollars in a year. But most people don't make that much. Most people under a hundred grand, okay? Uh, a lot of them around 50 or even below. But the average can look really distorted if you have some really high scores and there's some really high numbers, okay? Um, and I'll, I'll show you how to fix that in a moment. I'll tell you how to fix that. But uh, also the mean uh, is um, meaningless for nominal data. When you have categories, it's meaningless to talk about the mean, okay? It doesn't make any sense. Like if you're talking about academic major, what is the average academic major? There is no such thing. Or if you're talking about males and females, what is the average, you know, the average sex? That doesn't make any sense, okay? It's, uh, it's you only record, compute a mean uh, when your variables give you basically numerical data, when you have numbers, okay? <clears throat> the median is also um, a number uh, that uh, basically, that's kind of like the mean, kind of like the average, but what it does, it divides the, dis the distribution in half. The, mean, the median is basically the middle number, okay? So if you have a set of scores, let's say, if you have 10 people took a quiz, okay? Um, 10 people took a quiz, okay? All you have to do basically is arrange the scores in order and then find the midpoint. And that would be your median. So it's basically the middle, the median. And the middle is not exactly the same as the mean, by the way. It could be, but it's not necessarily the, you know, the middle, okay? Uh, like for instance, when you hear uh, about studies or reports that talk about income, they usually don't report the average income. Because like I said, the average, the mean can be distorted by extreme scores. They usually talk about the median income, median income, okay? In other words, what's right in the middle? What's that middle number? There's a lot of people who make a lot, a lot of people who make that, not that much. What's in the middle? Someone who would make some, uh, you know, an income that is right in the middle, what would that look like? Or they talk about the median sales price for a home because we have the same situation with homes. There's a lot of them that cost millions and a lot of them that don't. What is the middle number? And apparently based on what I just read over the weekend, uh, <clears throat> now in California, um, the uh, median home price is now above 700,000. Think about that. Think about how expensive that is, okay? That's the middle. That's not even a good home. That's just the middle number. And remember, most homes, you know, are gonna be in the lower range, but there's a lot of them that are, that are also worth millions and millions. But that middle one, the one in the middle is basically, um, you know, above 700,000, like 706,000. That is really high, okay? It takes a hell of a good income to afford a home like that, okay? That's what's happening in California, okay? Uh, home prices are rising. Home prices are rising again really fast, by the way, okay? Because there's a lot a lot fewer homes for sale, like about, there's about half as many homes for sale as there would have been like a year ago. Um, and plenty of people still wanna buy homes, so it's driving up the cost, okay? But the median is rising, and it usually does over time, okay? Um, averages usually rise over time. We're talking about income, home prices, things like that. Um, but th that is not related to psychology. That has more to do with other things like economics. But just so you understand these numbers, to give you some clear examples here. The median is less affected by extreme scores. The median is not going to be affected uh, by extreme scores because what it does is it takes uh, the middle, okay? And you divide the, you know, the scores right in the middle. What is in the middle, okay? You can have uh, homes that are worth... Uh, you know, 50, $40 million, but that's okay because they're all the way on the other side. They're all the way at the end. The middle is still the middle, okay? I could easily show you this if I were to uh, do this on the whiteboard, but I don't wanna switch screens here because then I'll see your names. Names will be recorded temporarily and we can't have that, okay? Um, so the mean is not affected by extreme scores, which is why it's what often is reported for income, which there could be extreme scores for home prices, which there are extreme scores, things like that. Um, but psychologists, by the way, prefer to use the mean, okay? The median, by the way, is meaningless for nominal data. When you're talking about categories, again, it's meaningless to say, what is the median sex? Or what is the median race? Or the median uh, major, you know, academic major? That doesn't make any sense, okay? Because medians, the mean and the median both refer to numbers. It has nothing to do with categories. Okay, so you can't 
report medians and means for categories, for nominal scales. Uh, the mode is the most commonly occurring score. The mode is just simply means what occurs most commonly. So if, um, you know, for instance, uh, let's look at the example here with the quiz scores. Uh, the mode over here for the, in this table, the frequent distribution table, you have X's, you have the scores, and then you have F, how many, how many there are each. The mode is the number that occurs the most. So that would be three. Three would be the mode, okay? It's the most commonly occurring score. If we talked about the mode, let's say for, uh, you know, for let's say, uh, well, here, I, I'll give you another example. If we talked about the mode, let's say for sex, um, you know, that would be uh, basically the sex that is uh, that occurs more often. So if there's uh, more males than females, then the mode would be males. If there's more females than males, then the mode would be females. It's just basically the most common occurring, commonly occurring score. It could be a category as well. It can be used for nominal data. It just means whatever shows up most often. That could be a number, it could be a category. All right, now here are some other graphs to summarize data for you guys. Uh, <clears throat> A right there, the upper graph there, mean activity level. Let's say as you, you, know, you get injected with some drug <clears throat> and you can see the higher the dose, uh, the higher the activity level. The mean activity level right there is on the, is the vertical line on, on the left and the category is the drug dose. Up to a certain point, up to about 30 milligram, right? Um, activity level goes up and then it declines after that. The drug might have a toxic effect after that but that would tell you that. Well, right here, the mean reading achievement score, right? Uh, those that uh, you know, were taught using, let's say uh, teaching method one, teaching method two, three, and four, um, what is their, uh, you know, what, what is the uh, achievement score, their reading achievement score, right? When they took a reading test, how well did they score? Uh, again, these graphs are a little bit more complicated. You have to do a little bit more work to generate things like this. You guys are gonna really do anything this fancy, right? And I don't want figures, remember? I just, I'll tell you guys what, we, what I do want when we actually talk about uh, how to write the paper. Here's another thing that, by the way, you have to know about all of these things, but you're not required to do all of them, okay? Just so you are aware of this. Here's um, some other stuff for you guys. Uh, so here's something else you definitely need to know about, and you're definitely gonna report. By the way, when you write your, just to tell you guys now, when you write your paper, your APA paper, right? Remember the psychology, right? I'm gonna to wanna to see means and standard deviations for your questions that are numerical, right? Average this, standard deviation of that. I'm also gonna to wanna to see percentages. This, you know, there was, you know, 48% males, 52% females, you know, 20% uh, black, you know, 30% white, you know, 35% you know, uh, Latino, something like that, right? Those are percentages. You're not gonna do all these, but there's some that are very obvious that you have to use and we'll, well, no, um, I'm telling you guys what those are now, but you also see those in, those in the examples. You definitely have to use the standard deviation. I forgot to tell you guys that um, the mean, the median, the mode, the standard, the, the mean, median, and mode, if you see over here, okay, uh, these are uh, measures of central tendencies. What that means is they are measures that tell us what's in the middle. And then we have here uh, measures of variability. This thing right here, the standard deviation, tells us how much variation there are there is in the scores, okay? So standard deviation provides a measure of variability by describing the average distance from the mean. What's the average distance, right, from the mean or from the average? Let's say, like if the average score on the quiz, let's say, um, you know, was, a, let's say, a, a three, what is the standard deviation? It's basically how much variation is there on average in the scores. Small values indicate most, most scores are near the mean. So if the standard deviation is small, that means most scores are near the average. Large values indicate, indicate most scores are scattered widely. If the standard deviation is large, that means there's more variability and that the average difference, that the, you know, basically that most scores are far away from the average, far away from the mean. The standard deviation is identified with by uh, you know, little s in stat books, you know, um, and SD for standard deviation in published reports. Okay, and just to make it visual for you, so it's just a, a measure of variability, okay? If the score is small, that means that the scores don't vary a lot, okay? And most scores are near the average. 
if the standard deviation is large, that means that there's a lot of, lot of variability in the score. And most scores are basically far away from the average. And just to, you know, so you can see visually what this looks like over here. Here's a graph, okay? It's actually a frequency distribution graph over here. Um, and um, it has an, a mean of 40, the average is 40, okay? And a standard deviation of three, okay? So you have the mean over here, the mean is uh, the average, okay? So that line, that vertical line there at the top of the graph at the highest point, um, it tells you the mean is equal to 40 and the standard deviation is three. Um, so the average is 40 and then most scores are within one standard deviation. Most scores are basically uh, either three points less than the average or three points higher. And if you can see that where those lines are, those arrows, that captures most of the scores. Okay, so the standard deviation tells you about variability is really what it does. And to make that point, here's some other graphs for you guys. So you can see that uh, graph at the top A there. Um, you can see that the, uh, the scores are a little bit, you know, less spread out than B. And B, they're a little bit more spread out, okay? So A there, that, that graph uh, A, has a mean of uh, 16.68 and a standard deviation of 2.23. So the average difference is 2.23, okay? Uh, the one on the bottom, B, has a mean of 45 and a standard deviation of six. You know, um, there is more variation in the scores on the bottom. The standard deviation is higher. And you can see that um, by looking at the graph too. Look, the scores are more spread out. The graph is more spread out. This is not a good comparison here. It would have been better um, if the scores here, uh, if the average for both distributions was the same, but the standard deviation was different. Then you could really see that, yeah, one of these is clearly different from the other. One of these has uh, a, a bigger spread in the scores. There's more variability, okay? So basically that's all that means. The standard deviation tells you about the amount of variability. If it's bigger, that means that there's more variation in the scores. And when you graph them, you'll see that the graph is more spread out. That's all that means, okay? So yes, you have to report the mean and the standard deviation when you have uh, you know, numerical scores for your study. When you have categories, you just report percentages, okay? Now, um, you can also do correlations. Here's the thing, here's the, um, I'll tell you, we, we all know what correlations are at this point. This is like maybe the third or fourth time we talk about them. I'm gonna remind you guys about what they are. And the difference is that after I stop recording this lecture, I'm gonna show you actually how to compute it. If I actually get to that, I might have to save that for Wednesday, but we'll see if we get to uh, computing correlations. But a correlation is basically, remember, it, it's something that tells you how things are related, okay? So it's, it's a statistical value that measures and describes the direction and degree of relationship between two variables. It could actually between, be between more than two variables, by the way, but we're not gonna get into those complications. But let's say two variables, like what's the correlation between age and health or something like that. We talked about this a lot already. Uh, the direction of the correlation is indicated by the sign. Remember that, right? The plus means we have a positive correlation. That means variable X and Y change in the same direction. If X goes up, Y goes up. If X goes down, Y goes down, right? A negative correlation means X and Y change in opposite directions. If X is up, Y is down, okay? If Y is up, X is down, okay? That's a negative correlation. We talked about this before. Um, the strength of the correlation. The strength is basically the, also means the consistency. Uh, correlations that are more consistent are stronger, okay? More consistent means that, you know, they're more predictable, right? The, you can tell very easily uh, what the correlation is and uh, you can predict very easily. Okay, so the strength or consistency of the relationship is identified the, by the numerical value of the correlation. We talked about this stuff before, but you know, the score can range from positive one to negative one. Okay, if you have a correlation of one, R equals 1.00, that's a perfect positive correlation. What that means is that if I know one thing, I can predict with 100% accuracy what the other thing will be. If I have X, I can predict Y. Okay, um, negative one indicates a perfect negative correlation. 
Again, if I know one thing, I know exactly what the other thing's gonna be, except now that the relationship is reversed. When one is high, the other one is low, but I can predict one from another with 100% accuracy. If the correlation is zero, that means there's no relationship. That means if I know one thing, I know nothing about the other. If I know one thing, I can't predict anything. Zero is my chance of prediction uh, for that other thing. The greater the distance from zero, the stronger the, the correlation, okay? Stronger the relationship, okay? Note that R equals 0 0.85 and R equals negative 0 0.85 are equally strong. One is positive, the other one is negative, but they are equally strong. Remember to determine how much you can predict based on the correlation, right? The coefficient of determination, remember what that means, right? You have to square the correlation. And if you square the correlation, the sign doesn't matter. So 0.85, R equals 0.85 and R equals negative 0.85 are the same strength, exactly the same strength, okay? If R was 0 0.90, right? And then another R is R equals negative 0 0.90, they're both equally strong. Because if I know one thing, then I have an 81% chance of being, able to, uh, of, no, of being able to predict the other. Because I square 0 0.90 or I square negative 0 0.90, I still get 0 0.81 for both of them. So they're equally strong, okay? So the closer the number is to zero, the weaker the relationship, the farther away it is from zero, whether it's on the positive side or the negative side, the stronger the correlation. And uh, here's uh, what data might look like for you to do a, a correlation. Now, with a, to, in order to do a correlation, there's several ways you can do it, but the easiest way to do a correlation is, well, you need scores, okay? So here you have uh, you know, a table here. You have participant A, B, C, et cetera, right? It could have been participant number one, two, right? That's the way we, we would do that, right? When we have our, uh, you know, our spreadsheet, but it um, doesn't matter, A, B, C, or one, two, three, okay? So you have the participant and then you have their self-esteem score and their performance score. So participant A, or we can call the participant number one, their self-esteem score is 62. The scale maybe goes from zero to 100, right? doesn't matter, but uh, it, they scored a 62. Uh, their performance, um, they scored 13. How high does the performance go? Uh, it doesn't matter, I don't really know, but we have a score as high as 22 there. So maybe it goes all the way to 25, I don't know, or maybe all the way to 30. Um, but either way, that's the self-esteem for participant A and uh, you know 62 and the performance is 13. For participant B, their self-esteem is higher. They have, they have a score of uh, 84. And their performance is also higher. They have a score of 22. For participant C or participant number three, their self-esteem is 89. Their performance is 22, even higher. So you, you're, getting, you get, you're beginning to get the idea there that, that um, the higher the self-esteem score, the higher the performance score. There's probably a positive correlation here. Um, you could see for the other participants what the self-esteem score is and what the performance score is. It doesn't have to be that everyone who has higher self-esteem has a higher performance score, okay? That doesn't have to be the case. Um, but what we do is that what we're looking for is uh, we're looking for the correlation based on all these scores, okay? Uh, what are we finding on average? And on, on, on average, we could see here that the higher the self-esteem, the higher the performance, or the lower the self-esteem, the lower the performance, okay? So you can see here, their person E, 66 is their self-esteem. They only got an 11, okay? Notice person A has a lower self-esteem score, but a higher performance score, okay? That's okay. But on average, okay, when we look at all the scores, the scores as a whole, we'll find that usually, not for everyone, but for most people, a higher self-esteem score means a higher performance score as well. And if we do the correlation, we compute the correlation, we would find a positive correlation. And I'll show you guys how to do that when I stop recording. When you do the correlation, it will look something like this, okay? So you plot the, you know, participant A, you plot their score, they had a, so the first uh, point there on the uh, lower, on the, on the left, right? You see the person got a, had a self-esteem score of 62, their performance score was 13 right? We're just plotting the points. You plot all of them and look, they tend to kind of cluster around a line. You can draw a straight line through that. You can see that that line would have a positive slope. It's a positive correlation. 
And the correlation, if you look there at the description there in, uh, you know, uh, for table 15.8, um, the correlation is R equals 0 0.933, okay? It's a very strong correlation. So definitely, uh, the higher the self-esteem score, the higher the performance score. This is hypothetical data, of course, okay? This was made up. Usually it's, you know, you don't get a correlation that strong, okay? But uh, just to give you guys um, an example, and by the way, uh, when you guys, uh, you know, do your own correlations, you don't report R equals 0 0.933, not that many digits. You only have to go, you know, to, uh, to, you know, to the second one there, 0.93 is enough. Okay, you round up. And, uh, yeah, and talking, speaking of that, this is the way you report it, the, the way you report a correlation. Now, this would not be for the example we just looked at. Um, I should have made it for the example. That would have been made more sense, so it's clear. But the way you describe a correlation, you know, is you describe whatever you found, right? And you put in parentheses, uh, R equals 0 0.65 comma space, and then N, which is the number of participants, equals 40, and then the uh, comma, and then the P value, which is the level of significance, right? P, um, you know, less than 0 0.01. That means it's significant, okay? And you'll learn uh, on Wednesday that if that P value is 0.05 or less, that means it's significant. That means that you have a statistically significant result, that it, it represents something real, it did not occur by chance. And N is the number of participants. That's the way you report it, but I'll tell you guys how to actually write this stuff, okay, in your actual uh, paper when we get to the writing part after this, uh, this chapter, okay? When we talk about how to report your results. This is just how to compute them. Okay, let's see how we're doing on time. We're doing fine. Um, this next part is on inferential statistics. And I'm gonna save that for the next lecture. So I'm gonna stop recording now and I'm gonna show you guys how to do this. Um, you know, how to actually compute these. This is just the lecture part.